pushing me, shoving me back. What happened then, Nick? I don't know. I'm not sure. I just remember him pushing me. I fell back against the railings, and he grabbed me. Here. By the lapel? Yeah. Sort of forcing me head back so I wouldn't move. All the time I was saying, let me go, get off me, but he wouldn't listen. He just kept pushing. Is that when you stabbed him? I didn't stab him. He still had hold of me here, forcing me head back. I couldn't really see, but we were both holding the knife. He must have just gone in then, because I felt him loosen his grip on me. What must have gone in, Nick? The knife. I felt all his sticky stuff on my hands. I looked down and saw it was blood. I thought it was mine at first, but he cut me. He was just laying there, on his back, and there was blood all over his shirt, at the front, here. On his chest? Yeah. I knew he was dead, but there was nothing I could do. Then what happened? Well, I was scared. My hands were shaking. I just stood there. It was like I wasn't there. It felt like ages. I don't suppose it was more than a minute. Then what did you do, Nick? Well, I ran. I ran home. I thought I'd be safe there. Chief Inspector Chapman, during your evidence, you referred to the knife as, and I quote, Cotton's knife. Yes, my lord. On what do you base your belief that the knife actually belonged to the defendant? I'm sorry, my lord, that would appear to be obvious. Not to me, it's not. Nor perhaps to the members of the jury. I'll repeat the question. On what do you base your belief that the knife actually belonged to the defendant? I didn't see where else it could have come from. So you assumed it belonged to the defendant? Yes. Did you make any inquiries concerning this knife? Yes. Would you describe these to the court? We visited a number of retailers in the area known to stock knives of a similar nature. To try and establish whether the defendant had bought such a knife? Yes. And what was the result of these inquiries? Well, as far as we could ascertain, no one in the area could remember selling such a knife to Mr. Cotton, but we did... Thank go you. To... You also told my learned friend that you believed the defendant to be in a drug-induced state. We've heard evidence this morning from the pathologist, Dr. Harris, that there was only one wound. That's correct. So during this frenzied attack by a drug-crazed assailant, Mr. Royal was stabbed just once? Yes. I'm obliged. Oh, one more question, Detective Chief Inspector. How many people did you arrest in connection with the death of Eddie Royal before you arrested the defendant? Two. No more questions. I just have a few questions in re-examination, my lord. Detective Chief Inspector, you talked about contacting retailers in the area concerning the knife. By the area, I take it you meant London? Yes. But could not this knife have been bought anywhere? Or indeed stolen? Yes, my lord. Once we had exhausted all known retailers in the London area, we began to widen our search, knowing that Mr. Cotton had only just recently returned to his mother's home in London. A mammoth task, I see. Indeed. Not knowing which area Mr. Cotton had resided in before returning to London made this task virtually impossible. And did you ask Mr. Cotton where he'd been staying before returning to his mother's home in London? Yes, I did, but he wouldn't be specific. If my learned friend will forgive me, nowhere in your evidence do I recall you referring to Mr. Cotton as being drug-crazed. Do you remember ever describing him as such? No, my lord. Thank you. Can you tell the court in your own words what happened on the night of September the 10th? Yeah. I was leaving Mark's place. Mark Fowler, that is. Which is where exactly? 45 Albert Square, Wolford. I'd been staying there for a while. My mum had come to pick me up to drive me home. This was just after 11. Anyway, we drove around the square. We were on our way out. When I saw someone climbing down a drain pipe outside one of the houses. Which house was this? Mrs. Cotton's. And did you see who it was? It was climbing down the drain pipe? Yeah. It was Nick. Nick Cotton. Surely it was dark. And if he was climbing down the drain pipe, he must have had his back to you. No, I'm positive. He turned round as we drove past. I could see him in the headlights. Clearly? Very. So there is no doubt in your mind that he was, in fact, the defendant you saw? None. No. I'm obliged. No questions, my lord. Dorothy? How are you? Uh, you mind?
You know, I don't mind telling you it was a bit of a shock when I heard it was your boy that they had charged. Well, it must have been a shock for you, too. Eddie was a good boy. Yeah, I think so. I wanted to write to you, you know, but I didn't know where you was. Oh, thanks, but there was no need. Well, I just felt, you know, I wanted to do something. Yeah, well, we all try to do what's right, you know, but, I mean, who knows what's right but something like this. I mean, it's hardly something that you're prepared for now, is it? I mean, take me, for instance, you know. I thought long and hard about coming here. I don't think I would have come. That's very strange. I thought it would be difficult. And I was even prepared to leave after this morning. But then, well, in a strange sort of way, I found it comforting. Found it comforting? Yeah. To hear them all talking about him and to know that he wasn't forgotten. And then with all this going on, well... It's as if he was important, as if he mattered. Well, of course he mattered. Yes, but... No one deserves to die like that all alone. No. Oh, I won't lie to you, Dot. I mean, I've got no axe to grind with you. And I certainly wish you no harm. But I sincerely hope that they lock up Nick and throw away the key for what he did. Oh, well, I can't blame you for that. I mean, an eye for an eye. Son for a son. Probably be me what puts him there. You? Yeah. What? You mean you're going, you're going to give evidence against Nick? Yeah. Well, you see, he told me everything. Before the police come. Oh, I am sorry. Oh, I don't envy you that. Oh, well, like you say. You've got to try to do what's right. What happened, Dottie? Eh? Tell me. Where did it all go wrong, huh? What the hell's going on? They're saying whatever they like out there. And she's just letting them get away with it. It's early days still, Nick. Prosecution counsel will have finished soon. Then it'll be our turn. Yeah, it might be too sodding late by then. Why does she tear into that Joe geezer? She never even asked him one question. Nor that doctor bloke. There was no need. We're not disputing the fact that you were in the square or how Eddie Royal died. So what are we flaming disputing? That you murdered him. You see that? Jerry's faces. Climb down drain pipes, drugs. Ex copper gets stabbed taking his dog for a walk. My prints all over the knife. And nothing's been said so far that you haven't already said in your statements to the police. Yeah, but it sounds bad when someone else says it. She should have a go at them. Make it look like they're lying. Things will sound better once she starts the case for the defense, Nick. So how many witnesses is she calling then, eh? How many people is she going to get to stand up there and tell them I didn't do it? The onus is on the prosecution to prove the charge. All we need is reasonable doubt. Yeah, but there ain't any so far, is there? I'm going down. I know it. Come and get rid of her. Get someone in who knows what they're up to. Look, Jennifer knows exactly what she's doing. Everything that's happened so far is as we expected. Well, excuse me if I don't start jumping up and down with excitement. A lot will depend on how your mother holds up. She'll be all right. Mm, but in what way? Well, she ain't gonna help them, is she? I'm her only son. Her statement to the police seems quite comprehensive. Don't matter. I know her. She won't say nothing to hurt me. Not when it comes down to it. Jennifer was quite keen that we discuss your mother's statement. How do you mean? If she repeats what she said in her police interviews, it could make things difficult. Which means we might have to try and discredit her. So? It could get a bit rough. Things might have to be said. What things? Well, that's for Jennifer to decide. But it could be quite upsetting for your mother. Oh. Might have to lay into her, you mean? Only if there's no other way. But if you don't want that to happen, now is the time to say. You must be joking. You sure that's what you want? Look, what I want is out of this place. Now, if you have to rip that old bat into shreds, then that's fine by me. Just get me a result. Dorothy Cobb. Take the book in your right hand and read the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the old truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. You are Dorothy Cotton, 25 Albert Square, Walford, East London, is that correct? 
Yes. And you are the mother of the defendant, Nicholas Cotton. Yes. Mrs. Cotton, I'm interested in the night of September the 10th, 1991. The night of Eddie Royal's death. I'd like you to explain to the court the events of that night. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Where do you want me to start? You spent the evening with a Mr. Peter Beale, is that correct? Yes. Well, shall we begin from when he left? Yeah, all right. Well, like you said, Pete come round. Peter Beale. And we was playing cards, draw the world dry. And it got late, you know, about half past eleven. And Pete got up and said that he'd got to go home. So I went with him, you know, to the door. And then Pete had gone. And I turned to go indoors and I saw someone running across the square. Uh, my Lord, that was later discovered to be Mr. Clyde Tavernier. The relevant pages are 145 to 160. But Mr. Tavernier will be called to give evidence later. Is it necessary for the jury to understand Mr. Tavernier's actions at this point in order to understand Mrs. Cotton's evidence? No, my Lord. If my learned friend has no objections. No objection, my Lord. Very well. I'm obliged, my Lord. Please continue, Mrs. Cotton. Um, well, like I said, I saw someone running across the square. Well, I didn't know who it was then, of course, you know, and of course I didn't think nothing of it because kids was always running around the square, you see. But it was then that I saw Roly. Roly? Eddie's dog. Well, it wasn't this really, but he was looking after him, you know, on account of running the pub. Uh, quite. So you saw Mr. Royal's dog. Was he still on his lead? Yes, only it was sort of dangling down, so I knew something was wrong. You know, I thought perhaps he'd run off or something, so I went across the road to get him. And did you see anyone else before you crossed the road to collect the dog? Mrs. Cotton? Sorry? Did you see anyone else before you collected Mr. Royal's dog? Yes. Who? Well, I turned round and I saw Nick at the window. You saw your son looking down on the square? Yes. What did you do next? Well, I picked up Rowley's lead and I tried to take him to the vic, but he pulled away, pulled into the garden. And it was then that I saw Eddie. And where was he exactly? Well, he was in the square, in the garden. I thought it was a tramp or something at first. And I saw the blood. And what did you do then? Well, I tried to scream or shout for help, but nothing come out. And I just stood there shaking. And then I ran to the phone box and I dialed 999, you know, and I think I asked for an ambulance. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I asked for an ambulance. And then I went back. And it was then I realised that he weren't breathing. So I just sat beside him on the ground. And then the ambulance come and the police. And they took me indoors. Mrs. Cotton, you said earlier you looked up at your son's window. Why was that? Well, I don't know really. I just turned around and saw him there. And could you see him clearly? Yeah, I think so. I mean, street lights was on. How did he seem to you? See? Did he seem agitated, frightened? Oh, don't lead. Did you notice anything at all about him? No, he was just standing there, normal light. He didn't have the look of a man who'd just been involved in a terrible accident. Oh, please. Mr. Moore, I think the witness has made it clear what she saw. My lord. Mrs. Cotton, I'd like you, if you could, to cast your mind forward a few months later to the week before Christmas of the same year. In particular, to the night of December the 17th. Your son was still living at home, was he not? Yes. Can you remember the events of December the 17th? I don't think I shall ever forget him. I'd like you to explain to the court, in your own words, the events of that day. Please, take your time. Well, I was getting ready for Christmas, you know, and Pete come round. Peter Beale? Yeah, that's right. Only he just heard that Joe, that's Mark's friend, that he'd gone to the police to tell him that he'd seen Nick out on the square that night. Only we'd always thought that he was in his room. So I went to look for Nick, to ask him if it were true. And what did he say? 
Oh, he denied it. He said that this Joe was lying, you know, and that he'd never left his room. And you believed him? Well, I wanted to. But you didn't? No. I asked him why he'd lied to me. Why was that on the square that night? Why he'd lied to the police? And then he told me. He got out because he needed to get drugs. He was desperate. And it was then I knew that he'd done it. I'm sorry, Nick, but I've got to tell him the truth. I've got to tell him what happened. I've got to. Done what, Mrs. Cotton? What did you know he'd done? Killed Eddie. I said to him it was you. You done it. I know you did. And I told him to tell me the truth. Stop lying. And it was then that he told me. He told you that he killed Eddie Royal. Do you recall his exact words? He's not a bad boy, not really, not deep down. I mean, he, he doesn't mean to do the things he does. Mrs. Cotton, do you recall his exact words? Well, he said that Eddie kept pushing him, trying to stop him from getting away. Eddie wouldn't let go of him, you know, he just kept pushing him. And then he said something about a knife, you know, now they fought, now the knife went in you know, in Eddie, and that he killed him. But, I mean, he wouldn't have done it, only he was desperate. Yes? Yeah, he was desperate. He didn't know what he was doing. I mean, my Nick couldn't... My Nick couldn't kill no one. Mrs. Cotton, did your son tell you he stabbed Eddie Royal? Mrs. Cotton? Yes. Wish someone would tell us what's going on. How long's she been in there now? Just under half an hour. Mrs. Cotton, I wonder if you would explain to the court and the members of the jury why you say your son climbed down the drain pipe from his room rather than leaving by a more traditional route, such as the door. Well, he was locked in. Locked in? Yeah, well, it was for his own good. We was trying to help him. Help? Yeah, Pete and me, we was trying to get him off drugs, you see. Heroin. Well, it was killing him. I mean, we had to do something. So you locked him in an upstairs room? Yes. What about the windows? Well, Pete nailed them up. He put wooden bars across them. You're saying you locked your son in his room in an effort to stop him taking drugs, a sort of enforced cold turkey? Yeah, that's right. So you're a trained nurse? Pardon? You have some experience, then, of drug rehabilitation techniques. Well, no. Are you seriously telling the court you attempted to wean your son off drugs by simply locking him in his bedroom? I know what it sounds like, but I only done what I thought was for the best. You know, we had to do something. He was killing himself. I'm not here to pass judgment on your ability as a mother, Mrs. Cotton. I'm sure the jury will make up their own mind. During your son's incarceration, did you at any time see your son with a knife? No. Did he have access to any other part of the house where he could have obtained a knife? No, the door was locked and bolted. I see. During this uh, DIY rehabilitation program, there must have been times when your son was frantic, confused, angry even, as he suffered the inevitable withdrawal symptoms. Sufficiently so that he had to be restrained? Well, he got very angry sometimes. You know, it wasn't him, it was the drugs. You know, he was in pain. And then I had to go and get Pete, you know, because I wasn't strong enough. He must have been desperate. Yeah. In fact, I would suggest when the pain of withdrawal was at its worst, he would have done anything to get away. Yeah. Including using a knife if he'd had one. I don't know. But he didn't have one, did he, Mrs. Cotton? Nor did he have the opportunity to gain possession of one. No, I, I don't know. Oh, come now, Mrs. Cotton. You locked him in a room. You brought him meals on a tray. You denied him access even to a toilet, placing a bucket in the corner of the room. Do you honestly expect the court to believe the defendant would have endured all that if he'd had some kind of weapon to aid his escape? Well, I don't know. I put it to you, Mrs. Cotton. 
If the defendant had a knife in that room, the temptation to use it to threaten either you or Mr. Beale in order to get away would have been too great. I My don't Lord, know. The surely can't be expected to speculate on what the defendant may or may not do. No, don't lead, Miss Wakem. I apologize, my lord. Did Eddie Royal know you had your son locked up in a room against his will? Yes, I just told him. So on seeing him on the square, he would have had good cause to try and restrain him? Yes. Enough cause to try and stop your son from going about his business? My lord, my learned friend insists on asking this witness to speculate on things she can't possibly know in order to endorse her case. Miss Wakem, that is not a proper question. My lord. After virtually being a prisoner for some weeks, did your son express the desire to escape? To get away from you, his jailer? Yes. Was there any doubt in your mind that given the opportunity, the defendant would try to escape? No. My learned friend asked you about the night of December the 17th. You say the defendant told you that Eddie Royal kept pushing him, pushing him back. Yes. That all he wanted to do was escape. Yes. Now, bearing in mind that your son wanted to escape the conditions already described, do you blame him for resisting? For defending himself? We was only trying to help him. Do you blame him? No. You also said the defendant told you that while he and Royal were struggling, the knife went in. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. The knife went in. Are those his exact words? Yes. Not I stabbed him or I killed him, but the knife went in. Yes, I told you. I'm obliged. I'd like you to recall a night some four months before the night of Eddie Royal's death. May the 9th, to be precise. There was a fight at the Queen Victoria. I believe a gang of youths from another area descended on Albert Square that evening. Yeah, that's right. Were you on duty that night? Yes. Yeah. Can you describe to the court, in your own words, what happened on the evening of May the 9th? Well, like you said, a load of yobs came in. There was about a dozen of them, I think. They'd been in a few nights before causing trouble and that. Anyway, this particular night, it all started up again. You know, glasses got broken, tables got turned over, and that's when Eddie came down. Down from where? He lived above the pub. He was up there. He tried talking to him, but uh, the mavious one decided to have a go. This was one of a gang of yous? Yeah. I mean... Like I said, you know, he tried talking to them, but uh, they wouldn't listen. He picked up a bottle, broke it on the bar and went for Eddie. He lunged at Eddie with a broken bottle. Yeah, Eddie was sweet, man. He just stepped out of the way, took this guy's arm, put it behind his back and took the bottle from him. Held him there till the police come. You give the impression that he disarmed this youth with some ease. Well, he was an ex-copper. They teach him all that, didn't they? Indeed. How big was he? In comparison with, say, uh, with the defendant. Not much in it. Roughly the same size mm. and build. Near enough, yeah. So knowing Eddie Royal as you did and witnessing his actions that evening, would you say that if he was faced with a straightforward struggle, a situation whereby he had to disarm someone, someone of equal size and build to the defendant, for example, if he was faced with such a struggle involving a knife, how do you think he would cope? One to one? Yes. No trouble at all. Not judging by what I saw him do. I'm obliged. Now, I'd like, if I may, to move forward to the night of September the 10th. Come on, Carl. I was nothing badly of you. Yes, they do. You never heard them. Everyone was looking at me. You tell what they was thinking. But they weren't there. They don't understand why we done what we did. They didn't know what it was like. Yeah, well, I'm sure that I understand what we did now. Seemed all right at the time, but listening to them. Listen, you've done your best by him. You always had done. No one could think more of you than that. Suppose they're right. Suppose I did drive him to it and they lock him away for life. How am I going to live with that? Doc, you didn't put the knife in his hand. Yes, I did. I was good at it. No. Yes, it was my fault, all of it. If I hadn't told Eddie, he wouldn't have tried to bring him back home. And if I hadn't locked Nick up in my room, he wouldn't have been trying to get away. So you see, they're right, whichever way you look at it. They're going to... Lock my lick away for life. And it's my fault. 